in the Wilderness by David Young. He had been lying in the brush about half a furlong from the river. It was broad daylight and he could not see any of his pursuers. He was starting to move when a hand came out of nowhere and grabbed his wrist. In perfect English, the person whispered, Don't move. They are still watching. We are safe from view, but we need to stay here until after dark. He looked through the scrub where he was certain no one had been a moment before and saw an Indian girl, just about old enough to be given as a squaw. He was bursting to know where she had learned such perfect English, but he took her cue to remain silent. The hours went by slowly as they lay in the summertime afternoon. Insects were buzzing around them, but she did not swat at them, so neither did he. Occasionally, a bird would call, and she would visibly tense her muscles. You're running from the Indians, he said as quietly as he could manage. I didn't know they were here. I'm running from pirates on the river. We are running from both. The men on the boat weren't sure where you came ashore, so they were looking up and down the river. But the daylight is dangerous for them, so they must have slipped up into the creek for covering until it gets dark again. They are leaving the daylight search of the land up to Quantapa. Only, he is more interested in finding me than he is you, Quantapa. All I knew was that they were trading with some Indians. One evidently met them several days ago at the mouth of the river. They are Tetwakan, or Cayuse, she said. No more talk now. I can get you, get us, away from them. When the sun had set and darkness finally began to seep into the gloaming, the wind picked up and it was cold. She did not seem to be affected by the chill. She put her hand into a bag and drew out something he could smell to be fish. The odor was not strong as she unwrapped it from a cloth, so he assumed it had been smoked or dried somehow. She handed some to him and he put it into his mouth. He was surprised at how good it tasted. It had been nearly 24 hours since he had eaten anything, weeks since he had eaten much more than mush or gruel. He wasn't sure anything ever tasted so good as the morsel given to him. Salmon, he said. Chinook, she answered. Then, yes, salmon. We can sit up now. Stretch your muscles first. She had rightly guessed that his muscles were in knots. He had wrestled the bond from his leg in the ship's hold, before his gruel had come, but concealed it until he had drunk the tepid broth they gave him, Perkle, Cook's helper, came to retrieve the bowl. As soon as the hatch opened, he hit the boy with a wooden bowl and pulled him into the hole. He listened for a moment and heard no alarm, so he quietly slipped out onto the deck and over the gunwale. He hung there a moment, knowing his splash could be heard. Then. He saw it. A log passing in the current large enough to hide behind in the water. Branches made some noise as they scratched the side of the ship. He used the noise of the turning log to cover his drop and grabbed one of the branches. The water was colder than he would have believed possible. And about half the time he was submerged and half the time hacking up water as the great log drug him along. He held on for dear life until the ship was out of sight in the dark. Then he let go of the swiftly moving tree and struck out for the bank. The river was huge. The far shore was out of sight. The near bank was farther than he wanted to swim. But swimming, swimming even in the swirling current was not as difficult as holding on to the log. He was exhausted. When he finally managed to drag himself ashore, he stumbled over the rocks into the reed grass. Seeing the thick brush, 
He made his way to it, passing out from exhaustion, hunger, and exposure. He slept into the next day. Now, lying still, fearing to move, for so long had brought cramps into his legs and arms and back. Still, he managed to sit up, waiting for her lead to stand. She, too, rubbed her legs and stretched her back. You have no boots, she said with some alarm. I ruined one getting my leg iron off. The other I kicked off in the water, he explained. She nodded, still frowning. You will have to run. We cannot stop for bleeding feet. In a moment, she was standing, pulling him to his feet as well. Crouching, they began to move through the brush just beneath a low rock ledge. We need to get into those trees, she said, pointing with her forehead. He could see a dark area ahead that he assumed was woods. They made it without incident. Entering the woods felt like going into a darkened cave. He stumbled over a fallen branch and she stopped abruptly. Then he smelled it. They both did. There was a horse very near them in the dark. Instantly, he doubled his fist, preparing for an attack. Sure enough, a tall Indian stepped in front of them and spoke harshly to the girl. The brave was probably right to assume the greatest resistance would come from her, but this time it was a mistake. Before all the words were out of his mouth, he hit the man with all of his might. The brave took the blow better than he expected. At least he did not fall flat on his back. Swiftly the Indian turned on his new opponent, but in a flash the girl pulled his own knife from its scabbard and drove it between his ribs. He stared at her an instant, as much in shock as in anger. He winced as she jerked the knife out and then crumpled to the ground. She grabbed her new partner by the wrist and began running into the woods. Let me invite you to follow Lily and Jonathan as they make their way into the wilderness and in this adventure discover God as they had never known him in their lives.